Milenko, this is Rediscovering the Power of Healthy Animals, the podcast that explores how healthy animals, from cats to cows, can help us overcome some of today's most critical challenges. I'm your host, Michelle Calvo Lorenzo. You're listening to Episode 2, Rediscovering the Power of Healthy Animals, Impact on Physical Health. If you tuned into our first episode, you heard from Milenko CEO, Jeff Simmons, on the positive impact that healthy animals can have on issues related to the world's physical health, mental health, and the health of the environment. We talked about how healthy animals are the X factor, or that key, that unlocks solutions to some of today's biggest global challenges. I'm joined by Elanco's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Shabir Simji, who is abundantly curious about this topic and aims to answer some of our questions today. Dr. Simji graduated from the University of Birmingham Medical School in England with a master's and PhD specializing in infectious diseases. He returned back to the UK in 2004 to take up a position at Elanco Animal Health as our global technical and regulatory advisor to antibiotics. With close to 20 years of experience, Dr. Simji is an expert in antimicrobial resistance, and he joins us today from the UK. Dr. Simji, it's great to have you on today, especially since there's a lot of pressing issues that are negatively impacting physical health of humans today. Can you give us a 30,000-foot view overview uh, to help us understand some of the key global physical uh, health issues that our world is facing? Yeah, hi, Michelle. Uh, let me first thank you for um, having me on the show. Um, that's a really interesting question that you're asking. And um, we do have a number of pressing issues that we are facing globally, and these are certainly very challenging times. Um, ho however, the two fundamental issues that we are facing, and in my opinion, although people would say they're very different issues, they probably both have the same um, solution as well. We can sum these issues up in really two words, obesity and malnutrition. About 10% of our global population suffers from mal malnourishment and, and probably another one in four people are suffering from what we would call um, hidden hungers. This means that they are getting food, but they're not getting the right kind of food in their diet. If we were to take each of these in turn, starting just with um, obesity, um, it's surprising to know that nearly 40% of the global population over the age of 18 is um, classed as being overweight. And this isn't just a first world problem. Um, people in developing countries are also classed as um, obese. Um, if we look at a study that was conducted under the umbrella of the global burden of diseases, they looked at obesity in 195 countries covering almost 70 million people around the world. And they noted that obesity spanned the globe covering both developed and developing countries. This in itself brings, brings along its own problems, though. You know, and we've seen a lot of studies that show that both overweightness and obesity have a higher risk for health complications. And the common ones that we all know about are things like type 2 diabetes, heart diseases, uh, depression, respiratory problems, and, and even certain types of cancers can be linked to uh, diabetes. Um, and these problems aren't just in, in grown people as well. There's, we've seen obesity in children as well, and most of it, both in adults and children, is linked to um, inactivity. If we then look at mal malnourishment, uh, more than 10% of the global population currently suffers from malnourishment. Um, and it, it's, it's not, again, not only in developing countries. If I take the example in the UK itself, uh, a number of children are not fed properly. And this becomes more evident during school vacation times when parents already struggle to put food on the table. And then in school vacation times where they have to provide an extra meal, parents just cannot do it. Um, it's got to the point in the UK where in some parts of the country, schools open during vacation times just to provide one hot lunchtime meal for the children. And that might probably be the only meal these children get during the day. Wow, that, that, that's really some staggering information there. And you're, you're talking about both these, these buckets, the obesity and malnourishment buckets. And, 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 and I'm intrigued to learn if you think there could be a, one solution for both of those major categories. Um, tell us more about how you believe we can make an impact. I think um, 
protein is going to be your biggest source. So milk, fish, eggs, um, they prob probably provide a substantial amount of the nutrients um, essential to a healthy lifestyle. Um, and they also lead to obviously physical and cognitive development as well. And we can balance the scale of obesity and malnourishment worldwide with, with critical animal protein consumptions. Um, you know, we have seen a number of studies that, that do support these statements. So, for example, if we look in the U.S., as an example, over the last 40 years, U.S. consumers have decreased calories from animal proteins, while they've been increasingly turning to uh, plant-based foods. Um, but during that same time period, we've seen obesity and diabetes increase. So, they're de so they're definitely, you know, definitely there is a link there. Yeah, so, so this idea is extremely large in scope, and you've highlighted numerous points and studies just there um, that are pretty impactful and eye-opening, um, but can you help me and our listeners better understand it? Maybe, maybe give us an example from everyday life. Well, there's a number of ways to help in uh, everyday life. If we have better and improved school lunches, for example, um, I think having better labels on food uh, which would help the uh, end user or the consumers better understand what they're eating so rather than just buying food if there's more nutritional value uh, on the label it will give the consumer a better understanding um, even basic information within restaurant menus can make a big difference and help the consumers understand uh, what kind of food they're eating and what benefits they can get from those foods Sure, sure. So more information that definitely I think would uh, reign true for those uh, families or consumers that are far removed from farming practices. So I bet that that all uh, can be very beneficial. And it sounds great in theory, but if it could work, why haven't we been able to do this yet? Well, there's a number of reasons for this. Um, and it's like most things in life, it really comes down to you know, supply constraints, um, some people have access issues. And I think the biggest problem is it basically all comes down to money more than anything else. And another example I'll give from the UK, a lot of people will be familiar with um, Jamie Oliver, uh, the chef. So he's like a competition to Gordon Ramsay. Um, Jamie kind of appeals more to the younger generation. And Jamie had this whole campaign uh, four or five years ago uh, trying to improve school meals for children. Um, and rather than having bland food, have interesting food, but food with more nutritional value. Um, this led to him delivering a petition to the Prime Minister's house. Um, this was then enacted on in Parliament, and the government did improve the quality of the food, the food with more nutritional value. But due to the cost of it, the government could only keep that going for about a year or two. And because the cost was so high, the government ended up scrapping that scheme. So at the end of the day, a lot of this does come down to the financial costs associated with it. Right, right. So it seems like there are some constraints, not just from access issues, but costs as well. Um, so... In your previous points, again, you mentioned that meat, milk, eggs, and fish, all, all that are what we know today as animal source proteins, right? That they provide a substantial amount of nutrients that are essential to this, the healthy lifestyle we're talking about, which includes physical and cognitive development, but as you mentioned earlier, can help balance the scales of obesity and malnourishment worldwide. Um, so, so why animal source protein? You know, there may be some listeners of our podcast today that are wondering, if we can get the same nutrients from plants or by um, increasing our access to plant-based diets, um, are these animal source proteins really sustainable? Um, uh, and you just mentioned, you know, access and cost are an issue. So what are your thoughts there relative to animal source proteins being sustainable resources? I think animal source foods are not only nutritionally dense source of energy and readily digestible protein, but they're also a very compact and efficient source of a number of bioavailable micronutrients that are very difficult to find in, in other uh, sources. Um, and these include things like iron, zinc, calcium, a number of vitamins, folic acid. These are all basic essentials that we, that we need in a balanced diet. Um, what was interesting was there was an article on the BBC just this past couple of weeks ago which was based on an uh, article published in the British Medical Journal. 
and it was titled something like the, the brain nutrients vegans need to know about. And it focused on a chemical called choline. And it said that, um, and choline, just for background information, it's, it's, it's important in um, helping transfer signals between nerve cells. Um, and it's also linked to good uh, liver function as well. So people that have low levels of choline seem to have liver issues. Um, and choline is very, um, you find a lot of choline in dairy foods and in meat as well. And this article uh, written by a nutritionist called Emma uh, Derbyshire in the UK, and she said that um, choline just wasn't found in plant-based diets and vegans um, that touched no source of animal protein actually had very, very low levels of choline, which were causing problems in liver function, um, but also they were having issues with um, um, uh, neurotransmission. Um, and she did mention the fact that, uh, you know, if these people really wanted to improve their health, they would need protein. And um, interestingly, egg, milk, and beef were the prime sources that were mentioned by um, Emma Derbyshire. Wow. So yeah, that article, and I'm sure many other articles that our listeners have read in the past, really emphasizes, again, the macro and micronutrients and their importance in having a balanced and healthy diet. Um, and, and today we're, we're, we're dem demonstrating that critical role that animal source proteins can have in such a diet uh, to meet those essential needs. Um, but let's, let's shift our, our focus back to our main theme again today, that healthy animals can have a positive impact on the physical health of humans. You've, you've done a wonderful job helping us learn about the impact that healthy livestock can have, but what about our pets, or as we in the States call them, our fur babies? Surely they play a role um, in this important discussion. So from your perspective, Dr. Simji, how do companion animals help improve physical health? I think that's a whole whole another area people sometimes tend to um, overlook as well. Um, and there's a lot of studies out there that show that having um, a pet or a companion animal does lead to a much healthier lifestyle as well. I read somewhere recently that nine out of uh, ten cat owners themselves felt that their pets had a very positive impact in their well-being. Um, and then again, we do have, again, a lot of studies that have suggested that Having a pet leads to you being more physically active as well. For example, having a dog, you will routinely take the dog out for a walk. You tend to play more with your pets. Um, and that does have an overall impact in your health, which includes leading to decreased blood pressure, lower cholesterol levels, and so on. Um, and we have also, I mean, from a medical standpoint, we have seen pet owners do appear to have a lower uh, systolic blood pressure and also reasonably low blood uh, cholesterol levels, which are all um, overall good for their health. And having put it all like that, I wish I'd actually owned a dog or cat as well. But believe it or not, I'm actually allergic to animals. More animals. Oh, but no. <laughs> Oh, no. Well, I sympathize in hearing that because I know from my own experience, having my own pets, dog and cats, that's definitely uh, contributed positively to my husband and I's activity levels and mental state as we juggle all of the things life throws at us, right? So I, I, I often wonder if our listeners have ever made that connection as well. And just think about the simple fact of just something as simple as walking the dog each day and how their daily lives may be impacted by that. Um, but what about from the perspective of children? or our older, more senior adults, what about the benefits of pets for those, for those people? Yeah, I think um, for both children and for older and, um, adults, having a pet comes with a number of unseen benefits, which people maybe don't think about, but it ties in very well with our initial discussion around um, obesity. Um, you know, currently, we do have a lot of evidence that suggests that children that live in households with a dog um, seem to be more physically active and they are then in turn less likely to be overweight, which then obviously leads to obesity. Um, we, we've also seen that having a pet as a companion um, can also be very beneficial to a child and, and even a young adult in terms of development from a number of aspects, um, including from an um, emotional standpoint, from a behavioral and an educational standpoint as well. 
Um, if we look at older people, again, uh, what we find is a lot of these older people may be living on their own. So just having that companionship of having an animal around is, is, is very beneficial to their health. Um, we also have seen in some cases where older people have pets, they seem to make less visits to the doctors as well. So it, so it definitely has a massive positive impact on both kids and older people. Yeah, wow. That Those are massive impacts. Um, very great to hear that. So before we wrap up, let me make sure I'm summarizing all your thoughts from today. So you're saying that animals, both food and companion animals, have the ability to make humans healthier. Yeah, you are absolutely spot on. Although I would re-emphasize one thing, and that is that all the evidence that we have seen or everything that's in the public domain certainly does point to the fact that healthier animals can make humans physically healthier. Great point. So yeah, again, healthier animals are the key to making humans physically healthier. Wonderful point to highlight. So Dr. Simji, before we wrap up, I'd like to ask you our fast five questions, which are five questions that help us to get to know you better. So if you're ready, we'll go ahead and shoot those questions off. You ready to play? Let's go. <laughs> Let's go, okay, number one. How would you describe your job in one sentence? In one sentence. Ensuring sustainable food, animal protein for future generations. Great. So number two, what is your favorite animal? Fish, because I'm not allergic to it. No, oh no. <laughs> Fish are great pets too, <laughs> but I'm glad you're not allergic to them. <laughs> so number three. Who is your hero or role model in your industry? In my industry, it would be a chap called Alistair Geddes, who's long retired. He was the, interestingly, he was the last physician on earth to treat a patient with smallpox back in the early 1970s. Um, he was also my professor as I trained in infectious diseases. And he also treated me when I had malaria when I was 13 years old. So I have a lot of to him. Wow, wow. <laughs> very, very impactful role model for sure. Number four, what are you listening to or reading right now? Right now I'm reading a set of books written by Terry Pratchett. Uh, it's a science fiction based on the disc world. Wonderful. And last question, what is today's greatest challenge that animals can positively impact? Um, I think this would be a twofold answer. Um, we've got food animals, and they provide a source of much needed protein. And then we've got companion animals, which, as we've just lately discussed, offer, as the name would suggest, companionship. In both cases, leading to healthier humans. So, to sum up, I would say animals are a very integral part of human life. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your perspectives today, Dr. Simji. We thank you for joining me today on the show. Hey, thank you very much. Today, we started unpacking how animals impact our physical health, but there's so much more to uncover. Stay tuned to future episodes where we'll continue the conversation with industry experts answering questions like, how do animal and plant-based proteins differ? And what's the science behind the human-animal bond? And furthermore, just how does protein impact cognitive development? Thanks for listening. If you want to explore more and rediscover the power of healthy animals, visit elanco.com forward slash rediscover. And tune in to our next episode when we will speak with Elanco's Dr. Tony Rumschlag, an expert on companion animals, to hear about the impact that animals have on our mental health. <laughs>